Hello, everyone. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, which I moved out of when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for almost eight years now and have two beautiful babies together. Yes, we do. And today we are very excited to welcome a very special guest. She is one of the um, people who represented the women, the FLDS women, uh, to get their children back after the raid in Texas happened. So we are so excited. Thank you so much for being here, Kelly. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Do you want to introduce yourself a little bit as far as um, kind of what role you played sure. in? Yeah. This one? Um, well, my name is Kelly, um, Kelly Fitzgerald. My name's up there. Um, and I w at the time of the raid, I worked for a legal aid organization called Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, um, also referred to as TRALA. And I was a member of the family law team and our specific uh, duties on the family law team were to represent women who were victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, uh, children who'd been abused and were in the CPS system, um, and also women who were victims of violence whose children had been taken by CPS because of the abuse that was going on in the household. And I had been working there since 1998. So I had um, a lot of experience in this area yeah. and all of the other members of our family law team were doing the same thing that I was. So we all had the same amount of experience uh, and we joined with the legal aid that was in San Angelo called uh, Legal Aid of North of Northwest Texas, I believe they were called. Um, and I believe we were invited in to help out with the case once uh, once things really started to spiral out of control. And yeah. I believe we were invited by both the state and the, the legal aid that was in San Angelo. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We're, uh, yeah, we're just super, super excited. Mm -hmm. And um, before we get going, anybody is interested in hearing more about what it's like for Sam growing up in polygamy, then please like and subscribe. Um, if you'd like to donate to our cause, which is really creating compassion for these FLDS communities and empowering people to tell their stories, not just people who have left the community, but also people like Kelly that are willing to share their stories of mm -hmm. their dealings with the FLDS and the compassion that they share for those communities as well. As well. Um, you can click the donate button below or go to our new website of growingupinpolygamy.com and donate there. The first main question that we mm -hmm. always want to ask is how familiar were you with the FLDS community as a whole before um, getting asked to take this job, basically? Yeah, bef well, before going in, uh, we all, you know, I had, I had seen various newspaper articles starting in about, I'm guessing 2005 or 2006 when they uh, bought the ranch. Okay. And, uh, you know, reading about that and about war, you know, Warren Jeffs, I mean, I knew about him and the allegations against him about marrying underage girls and, you know, forcing them to have children. Uh, and so, of course, that's really offensive. And I was like, like, oh, my God, you know, I, I felt I felt sorry for the women and the children because, you know, everything in the media was that they were being abused and they couldn't escape and. Uh, they didn't know how to escape and they were taught that anybody on the outside was, was evil and wouldn't mm -hmm. help them and would only hurt them. So yeah. that's basically, that's, that's basically where I started and where it, all of us actually started. Right. That's awesome. It sounds like you knew a lot more than, than uh, some people that yeah. we hear yeah. of that were involved in that where they had no clue. So at least you knew a little bit of what, what you, were you were getting into. Getting into. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. So, so what was the process like um, for your firm to get involved? You said that you were invited by the state, but do you know any of like the position that they were in when they decided we really need more help on this? Because you oftentimes hear that like mm -hmm. they didn't know what they were getting into. Like the state had no idea, right? They initially thought it was way smaller of a deal than mm -hmm. what it turned out to be. Um, well, I do think they were surprised by the number of, of people who were actually out there on the ranch and the number of children. Mm -hmm. Where they started to go wrong was when they made the decision early on after, after they had taken all of the children off of the ranch and put them in two different places. Um, there's a, some were put at Fort Concho, which was, I think, a community center, mm -hmm. and the rest were put 
at the Colosseum. And I can go into the conditions at the Colosseum <laughs> a little bit later. Um, but after they removed, after they removed them, I think if I look at my calendar, I think the removal came on April the 4th. That sounds about right. That sounds right. I knew it was sometime in April that yeah. that all happened. So yeah, yeah I actually had to print out a calendar of April 2008 to keep yeah. everything straight. Yeah, that um, was a long time ago. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sometimes it seems like yesterday, but sometime during the week of the 7th uh, through uh, April 11th, they made this decision um, instead of, handling the case, you know, putting the children in family groups, they decided that they were going to have one case for every single child. And when you do that, you have to appoint an ad litem to represent the child. Wow. Obviously, wow. one attorney is not going to be able to handle 400 cases or exactly. over 400 cases. And the number of attorneys that they had in San Angelo uh, in that county who could handle uh, these types of cases didn't reach the number that could have handled these, uh, handled all these cases. So they made the call out for any attorney anywhere in the state of Texas to come in and volunteer to be an ad litem for the children. And then when they started filing suit and asking for termination, the law requires that the parents be provided with counsel as well. So mm -hmm. now you not only need an attorney for every child, but you're going to need an attorney for every parent. Oh my goodness. And do so, you want me to ask you know, what, where does the <clears throat> crossover lie when you were finding these women or these girls who were the parent and a child, like the, the girl that they found that was 14 and she was pregnant. Was she I treated as a child or do you know if she was treated as a mother or both or. That's did they, that were, they, were treated as they were treated as children. And okay. um, here's one of the little areas where we, we can um, deviate from going through like a straight timeline. Yeah. CPS also decided that um, some of the women who were adults and had documentation to prove that they were adults were not. Oh, really? Uh, including one woman who was pregnant. Uh, at least one woman who was pregnant. Um, and so they said, well, you're not an adult, so you're a child, and you have to come with us. Mm. And I remember, uh, you know, things being said. I mean, I didn't have to deal with this situation, but I remember being told that uh, women were showing their birth certificates and their driver's licenses, which obviously weren't from Texas. They were from Arizona and Utah, depending on where they were living mm -hmm. in the Creek. Mm -hmm. And the response from the state was, well, those aren't from Texas, so we don't have to recognize them. Oh, which oh, wow. is not true. <laughs> yeah, no, that's so interesting. Yeah. Wow. There's so a, they were they were skirting around some of the law there to, to get what they wanted, it sounds like. Well, well, not just the law, but the Constitution. True. You know, the Constitution requires the states to give full faith and credit to the laws of any other state, which includes things like marriage licenses and birth certificates and driver's license. Well, not necessarily driver's licenses, but uh, that's why if you move from state to state, you don't have to get remarried in every state. You don't have to file for a birth certificate in every state. Right. Your your documents should be recognized unless there's uh, unless there's a reason, and they have to challenge that through a hearing. And they didn't do any of that. Hmm. The and this whole episode came to the worst con possible conclusion because this adult woman was taken off to San Antonio. Um, she went into labor and gave birth in the hospital. And then as soon as the baby was born, uh, the state just swans in and says they have custody of the baby. And oh, by the way, you're not a child anymore. You're an adult. Bye. Oh, no. no. So her husband oh, word. had to file a custody action in San Antonio in Bear County. And the judge there said, uh, this woman's an adult. She was an adult. You knew she was an adult. This child is hers. It's not part of the case. 
And they actually, I believe they actually had to file a restraining order or an injunction against CPS from attempting to remove the child. Interesting. Wow. That's Holy how, smokes. that's how far off. Uh, that's just get. how far out in left field that they went with this case. Wow. I mean, this, I mean, it sounds like there was a lot of confusion, a lot of people that didn't know what they were getting into. It sounds mm -hmm. like, and they were just, just kind of winging it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, well, I, I mean, think, I, I think at the beginning, it was probably more confusing, too, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we recently had uh, spoken to someone who was CPS that said after a week, washed her hands of it and said, she couldn't do it anymore. I can't do this. Like what, how it's being. And she even admitted to the fact that she was like the way that things were handled, like this wasn't policy and I don't know what was going on. You know, like the agents themselves didn't even know sometimes mm -hmm. what was going on or why it was being handled the way it was. And so, you know, obviously there were even higher powers than necessarily the people that were like on the ground having to do it. But it's crazy to hear that there were things, like you said, that far left field, like how did they get there? Mm. Yeah. And it was, uh, I mean, that, that, that woman wasn't, I don't think she was one of our clients because she had been labeled as a child. So, um, all I know about that case is what I followed in the, in the newspaper and what I heard through the grapevine that, cause I mean, all the ad litems and all of the, the parents attorneys were like, you know, locked in with each other and we had each other's phone numbers and we were calling everybody all the time. And, mm. you know, Hey, did you, you know, every time CPS tried something different, you would hear about it almost immediately, if not from your client, you would hear about it from one of the ad litems who was representing one of the children in your case or um, the other parent's attorney or even uh, members who had been excommunicated who were in contact with their family members. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So uh, because there was a move, uh, CPS was wanting um, – they, they kept saying, we're never returning the children to the ranch. They're not going back to the ranch. So that put really put pressure on these people to contact relatives that they'd been told to never contact because they'd been excommunicated mm -hmm. um, to contact them to see if they would be willing to have the children placed with them. Wow. Um, so and yeah, now, I, then at least they would be with family while they were waiting, but that would be a huge yes. deal for them to reach out to a, what mm -hmm. they consider an apostate mm -hmm. and say, will you take my child while this is happening? Mm -hmm. That is a big coming from within the community. I know that that would have been like the worst possible scenario for them. So it sounds yes. like they got to a point where they had no other option. They had no way of, of, of moving yeah. forward, you know, so that that's very sad to hear. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then one of the things that the, the, the appellate decision keeps pointing out is CPS made no attempt to avoid removing the children. And, you know, their position was, oh, there was absolutely nothing we could do. There was no place safe for the children. And, oh, you know, and they kept going back to, you know, the men are abusive to the women and the children and, you know, all that song and dance. Well, what we found out during our investigation was that the men offered to leave the ranch. Mm. They said, if we are the problem, we will leave. We will go somewhere else and you can stay and monitor, uh, you know, do whatever monitoring you need to do, but please let the women and children stay at the ranch. Huh. Oh, wow. See, so, that's another side of the story. I've never, heard. I've never heard in any documentary ever. I know we mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, like before, before we actually started the interview and we were just chatting that like, is so many of these documentaries, it's so, it like glazes over so much. It's just the raid happened, rip, you know, the children are mm -hmm. ripped away from the parents' arms and mm -hmm. then, you know, weeks later they get them back. <laughs> and it's yeah, like, and okay, it, but there's a lot in between that, that. Yeah. Why? That, yeah. And there, there's, there's reasons why that happened. Um, and it, I mean, the, I think with the documentaries is they just tend to forget that there were other attorneys besides the state involved. What I, I liked about, um, I think it was Preaching Evil, mm -hmm. the documentary that's on, uh, that's, uh, that's out there also, right. is yeah. they talked, they spoke with uh, Susan Hayes, who was an ad litem for um, 
uh, some of the children, I believe, I don't know how many she was representing, but I know she represented probably more than one. Um, and that's the only documentary that even asked, it seems, for input from any attorney who was not an attorney for CPS. Hmm. Yeah. And so it, a lot of this, you know, a lot of some of the things that I'm going to be telling you, they've never been heard before because nobody's bothered to come and ask us. Even when Texas Monthly did a 10 year retrospective in 2018, in the magazine, the, ma the actual magazine article, they spoke to everyone except for someone who represented the children. Um, mm -hmm. what, what was referred to at the time was a, as the Trolla Mom Squad. Mm -hmm. And they knew who to contact because the one there was one, uh, one of our attorneys who was constantly doing interviews with media and television, and she still worked for Trolla at the time in, in 2018. They could have asked her, but nobody asked her. It, it wasn't until she actually said something like, um, hey, this is a great article, Texas Monthly, but um, might want to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And so on the online article, there is there is a short segment with, about her talking about why the children went back. But for the most part, they just like skip over it. Hmm. And <laughs> you got you got to wonder if they do that intentionally because they want to focus on one side of the story to make it seem yeah. a certain way. I mean, media does that, right? They, yeah, they have I mean, their own agenda sometimes. And so uh, I don't know if it's that or if they just didn't know where to get the information. I, that's that's interesting, interesting, though. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just it always seems to be this major part of the case that's always skipped over. It's always glossed over. It's like we don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about having to give the kids back because it was embarrassing. Mm -hmm. Because if you read the the actual opinion, it what it the 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 appellate court excoriated CPS. I mean, they as an attorney, I can represent. I, I, I can recognize. Um, I can recognize when a court really doesn't like what one party did, and the some of the language that they used, it was like oh. Mm. Mm. Ooh, big trouble. <laughs> Ouch. Oh man, I'm so glad I don't represent the state oh, in this wow. case. Because it was it was um and and that's why I think the case um the the appellate decision hit as hard as it as it did because it mm. went contrary to everything that CPS and the state had been putting out at the time. Mm, wow. So interesting. So going back to when you first got put mm -hmm. on the case, what was the first um, when they told you, so you were going to be representing the children or did you specifically represent the mothers? Um, was it was it my understanding. We were, we were brought in to represent mothers. Okay. okay. Because they didn't have any money um, to, to go out and hire their own attorneys. So we represent people who, uh, who are considered to be indigent under the federal poverty guidelines. And so since they didn't have money to afford an attorney to, or to pay for an attorney on their own, they had to be appointed court counsel. And that was us. So the church, the church didn't step up and, step get, up money. and get the money because I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with what was going mm -hmm. on, like with Warren, because at this point he, uh, was still on the run, right? Until September. No, he was, he was already in jail. He's he already in he jail. Was, okay. He had already been convicted in the Elisa wall case. Oh, exactly. okay. He was already gone. Okay. Yeah. But still mm -hmm. the amount of money that the church still had at that point mm -hmm. is like an insane amount. So the fact that they weren't like these women and the children that were in the ranch were consecrating their whole lives and all of their husbands mm -hmm. and fathers were giving a hunt, like, a hundred percent of their earnings basically to the church. Yeah. So the fact that the church was like, Oh, well, consec you know, consecration, you have to give us every single bit of money that you earn. And then when something happens, they're not willing to like help or is like mind boggling a little bit to me. Well, well, some of the women were provided with private attorneys. Okay. So some of them were so just some the of favorite them women, were. the closer <laughs> you were to Warren Jeffs. And I hesitate to say, <sighs> the more favored wives mm -hmm. uh, were provided okay. with private counsel. They went, they went out and actually hired attorneys to represent them. See, and this but doesn't the surprise me. 
Right. Yeah. And it's kind of uh, confusing and also not surprising to me because you can see the Warren Jeffs took money and hired some of the best attorneys for his own case. Mm -hmm. yes. Right. He had plenty of money for that. And now it sounds like some of the favorite, I guess you can say it that way, uh, yeah. wives are the ones that were closer to him. But then for the rest of them, there was no money for them. That's very interesting that it worked out that way. Even though yeah. all of their money would go to Warren then would go to that. So that's, that's so sad, but again, not surprising that it worked that way, but yeah. Anyway, sorry, well, just it, a little interjection. I was like, no. Oh my gosh, like that's crazy. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and we just, and we talked about this before we started the, uh, the session, but um, it's interesting to note that none of these private attorneys that were being paid top dollar, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, signed on to our mandamus. And that's why in the in the decision, the appellate court specifically states this only applies to the named relators who are our clients and their children. Oh. It was the Supreme Court that worded their decision in a way that was interpreted as CPS has to give all the children back. But oh, the, okay. the appellate decision is very specific and it limits the decision only to the women who were our clients and their children. Oh, wow. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's what did that um, decision, is that what kind of uh, got the ball rolling to get it to the Supreme Court to be able to have the rest of them? Yes. Well, it was appealed to the Texas Supreme Court because um, CPS obviously didn't like it. Mm, naturally. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it, it's really interesting after, uh, you know, the children had been removed and then according to the CPS timeline, uh, you have to have uh, you have to have a placement hearing. Um, I had a timeline. Just a second. You have to have another hearing within a specific amount of time to um, uh, to make sure that the children are in the correct placement, that there's a safety plan in place, that everybody knows what they're supposed to be doing, um, and those were starting. Uh, the, the first day of, for those was May the 22nd, which was a little bit earlier, but because of the time frame, all of these hearings had to be concluded by a certain date. Mm. Oh. And so they started actually having the hearings early. Well, our mandamus had been filed really shortly after the, the adversary hearing, which ended on the 18th of April. And the actual decision came down the first day of those hearings. We oh, were wow. at we, yeah, we were at lunch. Um, uh, there was a bunch of attorneys from my uh, from from Trala. We were all having lunch together. And sorry, I thought I turned that off. Oh, you're fine. No. Um, we were we were all having lunch together in between these uh, in between these hearings and just going over like. What questions were they asking you? What questions were they asking you? What came up in your hearing? And you know, sharing information. And then um, one of the the head of the family law team got a phone call from the Austin office saying, um, "Hold your horses." The appellate, the uh, the Texas um, appeal, appeals court just came down and ordered the children um, sent back to their parents. And then it was. Uh, they were reading the decision off to us page by page as it was coming off the, the fax machine. And I was, uh, I had been working this case constantly since, uh, since we got involved and going to San Angelo at least once a week. Um, I, so I was physically, mentally and emotionally drained and tired. And so as they're reading this decision off to me. I, I just started crying. Well, I bet. Because um, my clients had been completely devastated losing their children because they they didn't they didn't abuse their children. There was no physical abuse. None of their children were close to the age of eighteen. Um, none of them were in danger of being married off at a young age. Um, they were very well cared for, beautiful, absolutely beautiful children. Um, and their parents were just devastated that they were taken away from them. And then the, uh, 
going out to the ranch and meeting some of the other people who were still there, especially grandparents. Um, the grandparents were just, they, they were even more devastated, I think, than the parents were. Um, and the difference between visiting them before this decision came down and visiting with them after was like night and day. Mm -hmm. because once they heard the children were coming home, everything changed for them. They became uh, more, uh, more lively. There was more color in their faces. Um, and they were just, you know, over the moon that the children were coming back. Yeah. yeah. So, well, and it's something you have to remember. And thank you for sharing that. It's mm -hmm. something you have to remember that, Yes, the leaders of the FLDS church were doing some horrible things, mm -hmm. but the, the people under their, under their leadership were human beings with children that they loved. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and being someone that grew up in this type of situation, that my worst, absolutely worst nightmare would have been something coming and taking me away from my parents. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I can say that firsthand. That would have been the absolute worst thing I can possibly think of at a young age. So yeah. anyway, I, I can understand where you're coming from. And I definitely feel for these children and parents and, and people like you that worked directly with this situation. And yeah. uh, I can only imagine what people were feeling and going through during this time. Yeah. Cause mm -hmm. most, most of them are just regular, just doing the best that they could and having yeah. good, happy families. You know, a lot of times it's so easy. I mean, obviously CPS did this and it's something that they did not do right at all was the fact that they took an entire, instead of looking at one specific case and saying like one mm -hmm. family at a time, like they would in the regular community, right? Yeah. You don't go into a neighborhood um, and you go round up everyone because there's abuse in one family. You round up all the kids from all the neighborhood. That's not how mm -hmm. it works. Um, that's how we had it explained to us, you know, exactly. but you don't yeah, go around. Up. Yeah. They, they really, they really stretched that or tried to, uh, stretch the definition of household. Yeah. To cover everybody. And one of the things they kept claiming was the, um, the, uh, FLDS were lying to them about their names. Well, mm. when we met with, when we met with our clients, they gave us their names and they told us the names of their children and those uh it's it's really interesting apparently there's a name that you have in the church and a name that you a legal name mm. uh, this is how it was explained to me that if a mother is reassigned to another man and his name is different than the name of the other the, of the father or the the prior husband then all of her children change their name to that new name. That makes but sense. But it's not a legal name change, though. It's not a legal name change. It's only the name they call each other in the church. If you would ask them for their legal name, they would tell you their legal name. And they would have documentation of their legal name. Gotcha. So when they did all of the DNA testing that was required by, uh, uh, by the, ju the um, judge in the district court, Every single one, to my knowledge, every single one of the children our clients claimed to be their children were. They were found to be. Um, they were found to be their children through the DNA. And when it came time to release the children, they were only released to their parents, who had been shown again by this DNA evidence stating that they were the parent of that child. Um, I think in one or two of the documentaries, somebody makes an illusion that, well, we know now some of those kids didn't go with their parents. I don't know where that came from because at least in the cases that we handled, they had to have even to even visit with these children or their children. They had to show the, the DNA results. Yeah. And we had seen in uh, keep sweet, pray and obey that, you know, rather than, that not going to their parents, that they were calling the parents from Utah to come and claim their children, right? Like the ones that had been separated because, yeah. I mean, Warren Jeffs was separating families long before CPS oh, came and yeah, did it, yeah. you know? So a lot of those children, the parents were having to come and get them because the mothers were still in Utah because they weren't worthy to be on the ranch. Yes. And so, you know, obviously, but I can totally understand what you're saying with the fact that like, but 
at the end of the day, those parents had to be the ones to pick them up. Whether yes. the church called them from Utah, whether the church had them on the ranch, wherever they came from, it was their actual parents who legally right. would be required yeah. to grab, the, you know, to have be there with them, right? Yeah, I, I think there was there was an exception because uh, I believe it was one of Warren's wives, uh, her sister had passed away, and so she had guardianship over her children. I know in that case. Those children were released to her, um, oh, but she okay. wasn't one of our clients. So, mm -hmm. but I mean, I'm thinking, are they really trying to twist the truth again in mm. this case <laughs> to say that not all the children were released to their parents? Well, in this particular instance, father was in jail, mother had passed away. They were released to the, they were the released to their the guardian, guardian, their legal guardian. Yeah. That makes sense. And this is just another piece of the story that people don't hear about because you will hear people say, well, the children were lying about their names. But to your point, they were giving the name that they were told within the church was their name mm -hmm. on documentation. It was something else, but they weren't intentionally lying about it. It just it came across that way. So there's always other pieces to the story that people don't don't really see the full picture here. And where that yeah. could cause initial confusion which mm -hmm. could lead a chain reaction of confusion too, right? Mm -hmm. Because if the child's saying this is their last name and then the DNA saying over here, but the parent over here is willing to say, no, these are our legal names. But like you said, a child would never know what their legal name is. There are well, still children. A lot that, of these children were like under the age of 10. I mean, exactly. So they don't even know. know what they were told. Exactly. Right. And so that comes across as lying where, and obviously too, I still, wonder and i don't know whether or not you can speak to this because it's complete speculation on my part yeah. but um i also wonder in some of these situations obviously they're going to be a lot more forthright with you representing them mm -hmm. than what they are with someone that they consider the person who's doing the work of the devil mm -hmm. yeah right well to me the way uh well we first, we also had to establish trust with our clients because yeah. you know we're coming in, you know, we were also outsiders coming in from the outside at the invitation of the state. And so we were already suspect. Oh, yeah. And so we had to really, really quickly establish a sense of trust. And um, um, I wouldn't say camaraderie, but we had to you know, really get their trust very, very quickly. How did that, um, could you expand on that for me? Uh, because from someone inside, yeah. <laughs> I can under, anyone from the outside coming in, I would immediately not want to trust this person. So yeah. I can understand where you're coming from. How did that look and how did you go about trying to gain their trust? Um, I'm, I'm trying, you know, I'm going back over like remembering what had happened mm -hmm. uh, and those initial meetings that we had with our clients, I think, um, I mean, I, I would, I probably wouldn't have trusted anybody coming in and saying, you know, hi, I'm here to help. You know, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. And I wouldn't <laughs> have trusted me either. Um, but I, I think it was over a series of, Coming, you know, we kept coming back, and we kept uh, we kept trying to get their children back. You know, filing the mandamus, and you know, going over with them what steps are going to need to be taken next. Yeah, you know, and it was uh, we just kept, you know, we just kept at it and mm -hmm. kept talking. Um, there were some uh, there were some topics that. Uh, you 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 learned pretty quickly don't bring this up because then you know the walls come up and that's yeah. it You're not going to get anything further um and it was basically anything relating to war and jeff so as long mm -hmm. as you didn't have to go around you know go through uh anything involving him then um they were they were very cooperative at least with us to deal and with you went, and when from the moment you went in the purpose that you had been kind of like assigned like as attorneys was to get mm. the children back from the very beginning. Right. So were you able to kind of lead off with that or did you have to, and I don't know if that's the right word, like not investigate, but was the goal from the very moment that you were working with them, was it to get the children back or was it to find out how that future relationship with their children was going to be? And it ended up getting 
their children back? Well, our initial, uh, well, when you're, when you're appointed to represent a parent or hired in another case to represent a parent whose child has been removed by the, by the department, that is your goal to get the children back. If your client, um, has not abused the children, Mm. um, in say a normal, I wouldn't say normal CPS cases aren't normal, but in your average CPS case, say your parent, say the parent you're representing has drug use. There's a problem of drug use, um, and maybe medical neglect or some, uh, or even physical abuse. Uh, your goal is still to get the children back, but you, you know, tell your client, all right, you have to, you know, you have a drug problem. You need to go to uh, rehab and you need to get counseling for that. And you need to be clean and you need to show the department you're willing to do, you know, to go to counseling and go to rehab and get clean and stay clean, get a job, uh, keep your house clean, uh, go to family counseling, go to individual counseling, whatever it is that safety plan is, you need to do it. Yeah. yeah. And so, I mean, so yeah, we were going in uh, to get the children back, but we were also under the impression that the women were being physically abused and sexually assaulted and the children were being physically abused and sexually assaulted. And so we also were, were there to say, look, if you need a protective order, against your against your husband or against the father of the children you, you need to take steps to protect those children we can do that for you too okay okay and so we thought we were going to be filing protective orders right and left oh wow we we i mean that was the the way um the way the state had described the situation to us the way it had been coming across in the media was that uh, we were going to be representing women in protective orders and custody hearings uh, between the fathers. And so we went in with a lot of information about, okay, if you want to leave, uh, you know, here's this women's shelter. Here's that women's shelter. Here's how you apply for benefits. Here's how you, you know, you know, basically set up your individual life. And so when we first met the clients, none of them wanted to leave. Mm. none of that they all said no nope, we've not we're not abused we're not beaten we're not sexually assaulted they didn't want to leave they just wanted their children back so we had to shift it, w it was the first couple of times i met my clients were really it was really strange because i had gone in with one mindset and it was like oh this is a different situation yeah. And so I think what happened with CPS is they weren't able to, or at least the people making the decisions above the, above the investigators and the caseworkers weren't able to make that shift. Mm -hmm. They just wanted to blame, you know, they, they wanted Warren Jeffs and they were going to get him any way they could, hmm. which, you know, it's good. I'm glad he's in jail and I'm glad he's in jail forever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But in the meantime, just because he did, um, he married underage girls and he sexually assaulted underage girls and some of the other adult men at the ranch did, that doesn't mean everyone. Yeah. And right. it was only if you look at the men who were actually um, indicted for underage marriage, those were his, like the real, real inner circle. Mm. There were a lot of men out there who didn't abuse their wives and didn't abuse their children. Yeah. And That's they, definitely were, they were painted with the same brush. So I was never at the ranch, but yeah. I was a part of the community. Mm -hmm. And I can say from my personal experience that my father was a very good man who loved his wives, who loved his children. And I never saw any type of that of abuse. Mm -hmm. So yeah. very, very good man in my eyes. And to your point, I feel that there were a lot of men that way. And a lot of, and some of these men that did commit some of these crimes uh, also, I believe, were under the direction of Warren to do so. So I, mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, not, I'm not excusing their actions by any means, but I am saying that Warren seemed to be 
the one in charge of making a lot of these things happen that were just wrong yeah. what put people in prison and, and and just because you can understand how it happened and explain how it happened doesn't mean you condone that exactly exactly oh. Because I, I can see like some of the answers that, you know, CPS seemed to be so shocked over were, were all the, the girls writing in their diaries that uh, they wanted to become mothers and have babies as soon as they possibly could. Well, <laughs> given the amount of spying that was going on, you know, in, in, inside the FLDS, would a young girl want to write anything else in her diary that her teacher is going to read and report on? I don't think so. And that's a good point to bring up that though some of these women may have said everything was fine and dandy, that doesn't mean it was. Uh, yeah. they, were, they, were, they were in a position where they didn't feel like they had any say in the matter. It was, mm -hmm. it was who they were supposed to be. It was what they were supposed to be. In their mind, it was the only way to return to their Heavenly Father after this life. Mm -hmm. So they were going with the flow. Um, so anyway, that is a good point to bring up. Yeah, the because side. if they said something that was uh, that Warren Jeffs would have taken offense to, their family would have paid the price for that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a lot of pressure, not just on an adult, but on children. Oh, yes. And that was, I mean, that was, that's been one of my concerns this whole time. Because, you know, like I said, um, Early on, I was really glad to hear your experiences growing up because there was always that you know, question in the back of my mind. Were the children saying this just because they were being told to or were they really bond as bonded to their parents as they appeared to be and as they said? And I can say, you know, listening to you, I can say, okay, they were. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they were as bonded. They were as well cared for. I mean, these children were perfectly healthy. They were very well care cared for. The houses were in immaculate condition, considering the number of children running through them. And they'd been there about, what, two, three years by the time mm -hmm. of the raid. These houses looked brand new. The furniture looked brand new. Um. Everything was sparkling clean. The food, and you know, they they provided their own food. Um, and I I had a couple of meals with them uh, when I was there. Uh, some of the trips that I took out, um, and you know, it was basically homemade meals. You know, healthy mm -hmm. nutritional meals, which uh, kind of gave everyone a laugh when we read over the safety plans, where the safety plan required the parents to provide nutritional food for their children. <laughs> yeah, it's like definitely already were. not the typical um very unique CPS case, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's yeah, what well, um yeah, yeah, we've heard that even from CPS workers themselves, mm -hmm. like the agents who went in and they're like, you know, we're used to seeing drug addicts and people with guns in our like all all sorts of crazy scenarios to take yeah. children and these children this was not that was not their reality mm -hmm. right like no. they are well taken care of they're well groomed they have haircuts their hair is combed they are, have good clothes on all those type of things that their clothes are clean their faces are clean their you know their yeah. hair is well done yeah um i mean i i keep going back over the allegations from cps and um, all of the things that they did to create this hysteria, uh, like it was shocking that the children didn't like uh, that the children wouldn't eat pizza and hamburgers and hot dogs and candy because that was the first thing that they did when they took them off the ranch. Like, oh, my gosh, we have to feed all these children. Well, everybody ran to the pizza parlors and brought in pizza and they brought in hamburgers and candy and they were shocked that the children didn't want to eat it. Some of them did, but they got sick. Hmm. And <clears throat> somehow that meant the FLDS parents were bad parents because their kids or their children, I should say, didn't want to eat uh, junk food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then another one was, oh, my goodness, the children have never seen Crayola crayons. Well, they'd never seen Crayola crayons because at least at the ranch, I don't know, uh, in Hilldale <coughs> or Short Creek, they used uh, color pencils. Mm -hmm. 
they didn't have crayons. So of course they'd never seen crayons. They used colored pencils. Hmm. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that they didn't have any chance to do artwork. It just meant it looked different than the outside. And there, there were several, um, there were um, several of the uh, the grandmothers that I met who painted. And they were showing, they would show me the paintings that they were working on and the paintings that they had done. So yeah, I mean, the children were doing artwork. And if you walked into the school, there were on the walls, there was some artwork. I mean, it was all, you know, religious related and related to, you know, what they were being taught, but it's still artwork and it was still coloring. Right. Yeah. It's so, it's so <laughs> hard when, um, when things are so wrapped into that religious construct, because it's hard to know, like you were saying, with whether or not they were willing to um, ever do anything that would be against what Warren just said. Yeah. And yet that truly is still part of their identity. Like just as an example, when you hear um, the stories of some of these young girls saying that they wanted to be married at 14. Yeah. And it's like, well, obviously we know that children can't consent at 14, right? Yeah. So on the outside, we know that that's not okay. However, if they've been taught their entire life that that is their purpose, mm -hmm. that is going to be their number one desire. So are they mm -hmm. actually not sincere in that? No, they probably are sincere in that. Is that spiritual coercion at a certain level? Yes. But how, how can the law protect people from spiritual coercion? I don't know. If, I don't think there's a way. There's well, no how, way to be able to distinguish. Yeah. How, how can you do that without going in and dictating what a religious, what religious beliefs you can have and what religious beliefs you can't. Exactly. And you can't do and, that. <laughs> well, you know, there's, a, there's a whole amendment on that in the constitution um, yeah. might come as a surprise to some people at the state, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shock. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and, and you know, there's there's also a thing called uh, due process. Uh, that's Amendment Number Four. If anybody in the state is listening to that, <laughs> um, Amendment Number Please. Four might want to review it. Um, basically, uh, the due pro your due process rights in any kind of uh, uh, lawsuit, whether it be civil or criminal is that you have a right to be noticed. You have a right to be informed that there is a lawsuit pending against you. You have a right to be informed of the nature of the lawsuit, like what are what are, what is the lawsuit saying that you did wrong, and you have a right to respond. And as far as I know, a couple of our clients that we represented were never named in the lawsuit. Their children were never named. And they were never provided service of the lawsuit as provided by law.